Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series Times Talks. Welcome to tonight's installment of Screen Times, which features exclusive screenings of the most anticipated new movies, followed by conversations with top film talent. I want to give special thanks to the presenting sponsor of Screen Times, HBO, and to share the following brief video message. So many people want the Russian throne. You have no idea how difficult it is to maintain such a thing. How many the dangers. How varied the directions from which they emerge. But I survive as I have survived for half a century. I will not share my throne with anyone. And now, please join me in welcoming our moderator, New York Times culture reporter, Milena Rizek, and our special guests, the co-stars of Harriet, Cynthia Erivo and Leslie Odom Jr. I guess you guys like the movie. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia and Leslie, for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you about this incredible film and that incredible song that you heard over the closing credits. I'm guessing you guys realized was Cynthia singing as well. <laughs> so we're going to have a, a fairly informal conversation yeah. and talk a little bit about the the orientation and the history of this movie. I want to start by talking a little bit about the context of telling this story now. You know, the thing that's fascinating, I think, about this movie is that with so much African American history in America, so much of it has been buried, mm -hmm. untaught. You know, we think about a movie like Hidden Figures that told the story of Katherine Johnson and the NASA program. Harriet Tubman is actually somebody we, we knew something about, or so we thought, but it turns out that much of the history about her was either wrong or not fully captured. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what did you guys, what were you surprised by when you started doing research about this figure and about this era? I, they, they, because, again, we know the broad strokes. We know, uh, you know what she did and how many times. So we know that she did the run to freedom for 100 miles. We know that she came back over and over again. We know that. Um, but it's the details about her that I was really surprised about. The, the very beginning when she um, goes to uh, Edward Burtis with the, the letter that says that her mother should be freed. Now, in, in real life, she saved that money uh, over a, a, a long time because she was only getting paid a very small amount when she was hired out to other farms to go and hire the lawyer who wrote up the papers that, that proved that her mother should have been free when she was 45. And I, to me, the, uh, the ingenuity that would take uh, at that time with I don't know who would have told her to do that, who gave her the advice to do it, where she got it, where she got the bravery to, to pluck up the courage to even go and find a lawyer. She couldn't read or write, so there had to be trust there also that this person was writing the information correctly. Um, and, and, and the idea that she had this sweeping love for her husband. Um, I knew she was married, but we didn't know that her first journey back was for her family and for her husband. And I feel like that spins it on its head. It stops being just a story of heroics and great uh, bravery, but love also. Um, and to know that Harriet Tubman was loved and loved back is kind of, there's something really grounding about that. There's something really special about really understanding that this was a woman. Right, because the images that we see of her, she doesn't look like a romantic. No. No, and, and I think it's true, but, but Harriet, I think it is a bit of a romantic. I, I also discovered that she likes uh, strawberries and fine china. <laughs> but, I mean, <laughs> it's not, you, don't, you look at the images and you don't see that. It's, you, it, it's like history sort of bypassed her youth and went straight to her, her middle age and her, uh, her older years. But there was, she had youth and all of this work was done in her youth. I don't think she was more than... I want to say she was like 28, 29 when she did her first run. So she was young when this was all happening. But we just, we haven't got that. I think the only picture, we're lucky enough to see this most recent picture of her with the Underground Railroad. And that's the most useful, useful picture we've seen of her so far. Right. Yeah. And Leslie, what about for you? How much did you know about your character? About William? Yeah. I knew, I knew the broad strokes. I grew up in Philadelphia. So I knew about his work with the Underground Railroad. So I knew about his his life's work, his passion, but 
Um, my, my job for the movie was to sort of fill in those chapters before that. Um, uh, that was the most useful stuff for me. Um, the childhood stuff was really interesting. You know, it's not, there was no place for it sort of in the, in the movie, but, um, you know, when you think about motivations, you know, William still never spent a day of his life in chattel slavery. He was born in New Jersey, but he was raised by two escaped slaves, both of his parents. And his, uh, his mother, his father escaped before his mother. His mother had four children. Uh, she, she had two escape, two failed escape attempts. Um, and then on, the, on her third escape attempt, she made the impossible decision to leave two of her children behind. She left, two, she left her boys behind and she took her daughters with her to New Jersey. And so um, in putting together the portrait of William, you know, I just, I sort of, you know, imagined my relationship with my mom and, you know, that protective thing that I have with her and just, just, just imagining that sort of, um, to be raised by a woman who must have been grieving for the rest of her life. You know, there must have been some part of her that he could never access. You know, do you hear about it from an older sibling that says, you know, here's why mom's that way. Do you hear, do you, do you hear a rumor of it? But you know, that, that something like that could uh, potentially set you up you know, for, for your life's mission, that you're always trying to correct that thing, fix that thing in your mom that you, that you never really could fix. But that was his personal connection to, um, to chattel slavery, having never spent a day of, uh, you know, uh, of his life in, in chains, you know. It, it, it's an interesting take on the, on the story because it's, it's a biopic, but it, at the same time, it's really like an action-adventure mm -hmm. movie, which is another element that we probably don't think about mm -hmm. when you think about what she accomplished. Why did, what was it appealing to you about presenting her that way and kind of doing those sequences? And also tell us if there are some that were you know, challenging to shoot. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it was challenging to shoot. Um, uh, and, and that's probably what was appealing to me. Um, <laughs> that makes me flatten for punishment. Um, well, she, do you know the fact of the matter is we've never seen a black woman in the, in the middle of a story like that doing these action uh, sequences in a period movie really ever. Uh, it just doesn't exist. Um, so. so. <laughs> So, so I, I, I wanted to, and, I, and it's part of her story. That's, that's what she did. These missions weren't, you know, fabricated. That she did the 100 miles and went back. She, w did her, she was dressed in disguises most of the time so that she could be in plain sight. Uh, she scaled up the side of a, a, of a cliff, all of those things. And I think what appealed to me was the challenge of being able to make that work and be as convincing as I could when I was doing it. Um, I did my own stunts, bar one. Uh, <laughs> again, glutton for punishment. <laughs> uh, but mainly because I knew that I, I, I kind of wanted to be as close to her as I possibly could, you know what I mean? I didn't, I sort of wanted to remove as much of the veil of uh, uh, make-believe. Uh, I wanted to be as close to her reality as I possibly could be, which does come with challenges when it's 37 degrees at night and you have to walk in some water. It's, you, you realize that, you know, it's very real when, it, when the water hits your skin. Um, but then you, you sort of understand that uh, you're a hundred times safer than, than she would have been because when you get out of the other end, someone's gonna cope for you. And no one had that for her. So I was happy to oblige in being a part of that. But yeah, I, that's why it had, just hasn't been done. and We haven't seen it and I feel like when you see it, you can, you know it's possible. Are there feats of bravery that we, I mean, obviously the film had to compress so much of mm -hmm. her um, incredible life because she lived such a long time, especially for her, mm -hmm. for her era. Are there feats of bravery that you think like, God damn, if only either I'd got to shoot that or that got to be in the film? Uh, yeah, there's a moment that we shot uh, where they, had, they hung a snake from the, so I, where I, you know that there's a bit where I run and I fall into like this ditch and I start crawling off. There was, we also shot a little bit from it as, as though she was hiding behind like a rock or something and there's a big log that's, that was just overhead and a snake was hanging off it looking at me. We shot that, but 
now I realise that we didn't need to shoot that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, <laughs> I wish you would have seen it. <laughs> yeah, that's Indiana Jones territory yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. Um. Oh, and a crow. We had a crow at one point. He was like right at my face. Like I was lying down this way, and the crow is like there. And she was very skittish. This for this crow. Her wings kept moving in like wide span wings. You're thinking that's going to hit me in the eye at any point. But that would be fun, wouldn't it? Is this the most animals that you've worked yes. with? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, I like animals. I really do. I do. Who <laughs> knew? I did. I. I um, we do think of the underground. Uh, Railroad leaders as kind of these revolutionaries, but mm -hmm. one thing I was surprised by in this depiction is this sort of politesse that they had, mm -hmm. especially William Still, um, and this sort of etiquette that they ran their organization with. Mm -hmm. Talk to me, Leslie, about how um, about putting that on screen and kind of learning about that as well. Well, yeah, it was a, it was a sophisticated uh, network that that had to be, you know, it was a secret society. You know, there were there were a whole lot of people. You talk about allies. Mm -hmm. You know, there were a whole lot of people uh, that had to risk everything they had to see to it that black people um, could make it to freedom if mm -hmm. they if they wanted to, if they were lucky enough. Um, which is an impossible, disgusting choice that people ever had to make. Mm -hmm. But there was there was a network, a sophisticated network that had to be in secret. And uh, in thinking about also William. Um, and Harriet, you know, both on the on the front lines yeah. of the movement. Um, there for their own reasons, but you know, really it was important to Casey and to, to me, you know, to all of us to, to show these two different uh, portraits of black life living in America at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. You know, that that they could both be, you know, integral to the movement, but William and Harriet couldn't be farther from, yeah. you know, like he didn't know about what she knew about. And mm. in, our, in the film, we try to mine it for as much drama and comedy as possible, you know, that they're, that they're yeah. you know, opposite. I, I love the fact that, that one, you, William has etiquette. Yeah. Harriet does not know what that means. Yeah. That is a waste of time yeah. to her. And I think that, that that combination of them having to figure that out is um, really fun to play. Yeah. With that was really fun to discover and, and grow because she wouldn't have the idea that we can't do it now is what, what do you mean we can't do it now right like we, we have to do it now There's no, yeah. <laughs> right yeah but as you know it, William was was uh, a part of you know a, a few people he wasn't the only one but a few people they were in charge of making sure that this thing didn't collapse and that you know that the network was there for stayed there as long as it needed mm. to, to be there. Um, but yeah, people, people got caught, you know, people got caught, people died, you know, allies were, allies were also lynched and murdered. I mean, it was, it was a very, very serious undertaking. Now, both of you guys come from the theater world. Maybe you guys have <laughs> heard about that. Cynthia, this is the first movie that, not only the first movie that you were sort of at the top of the call sheet for, but one of your first movies at all, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously theater operates very differently than film, but one of the things is many film directors don't like to rehearse mm -hmm. um, because they prefer that sort of raw take. What was your experience here and, and did you like it compared to theater? I think so sometimes we would, we would rehearse, um, depending on what the what the setup was. If it was a big moving scene, we would need to rehearse it first. Um, often we would come and just try out a take and then really get into the, the meat and bones, meat and veg of the, that's what it is, isn't it? <laughs> of, the, of the scene. Um, but I, I think the, the main difference uh, when it comes to filming and, and theatre is that you have, there's an immediacy when, when you're on stage. Uh, your audience will tell you what they want. Uh, and you can cater to it because of that. Uh, when you're on screen, you kind of have to trust everyone else around you and your your own sort of gut, I guess. And, and sometimes that can be shaky. But I think with this, because there was so much to do, I, I really had to to lean on 
on what Casey needed and what Casey thought. And Casey Lemon's the director. Yeah. Uh, and what this one needed and what he thought. Because <laughs> it's just helpful. And, and it, what's great is when you, when you have people who know what they're doing and, and are really giving in a scene, you can forget about what, what you need. And the main thing is what, what the person playing opposite you needs. And it stops being about yourself, which is really helpful. Yeah. And what about those moments when you don't have a, a scene partner? Because obviously, in, in theater, you know, you do have the audience to bounce mm -hmm. back off, uh, back off. But the the moments when you just have, you know, the camera, is a very different kind of scene partner than yeah. Leslie. Yeah, you just I guess you have to work it out. Yeah, you have to get rid of vanity, I guess. Um, I I I'm, I knew that there was a story to be told. So you you. you have to discover where that person is in that moment and why they would be talking to themselves and, and why they might be talking for, in her case, it, would, it was always God that she would have the conversation with. So it never felt like, like I was on my own. It felt like I was having a real conversation with something that was very present. Um, and because, because I do believe in God, it was easy to just access that uh, really and truly. And so you access that and you, you have a real conversation. Um, when, you know, even when we do talk to ourselves, we're very, very uh, sure of what it is we're saying and the conversation we're having. And no one can tell us that we're, we're loopy for it. We have our full conversations um, and no one doubts that we mean what we say. And so I think you just, you commit to it. Yeah. And, and Casey will tell me if she doesn't believe something I'm saying. Yeah. I hope everyone has that self-confidence and Cynthia has when they're having those conversations with themselves. <laughs> You should. <laughs> you should. <laughs> Le Leslie, as somebody who's had the experience of playing a historical figure before in Hamilton, um, obviously this is a, a big role. Will William Still's ancestors are still uh, around, of course, and they're you know his family was ended up being quite prominent. Um, wh what what did you bring to this to this experience, having had that experience in Hamilton? Well. Um, I should also say here that I, you know, I also did my own stunts in the movie. I, um... <laughs> that was me sitting behind that desk. Every pencil, <laughs> the pencil that you saw, I actually <laughs> operated it. I, um, I... <laughs> that cup you handed me was so dangerous. <laughs> I, I, I learned in the... There was a part of that Hamilton in, in that process. I was reading so much, and people were bringing me gifts. They would bring me Burr books early on at the public, and in and, and previews, they would bring, and I had to read everything, everything that everybody gave me, because I was, because I had to. Um, and so I, early on in the process, I started to get a little bit bogged down with the research, because I was like, okay. Okay, so I just read this, I learned this new fact, you know, maybe I can play this moment up in the dark. You know, I know Lynn didn't write it, but I feel like if I play this moment, you know, from Burr's childhood up in the dark, they'll, it will read to the audience. It did, and it did. It did? Okay. It did, it read. <laughs> it did, it read. But what I, what I realized, what I had to realize in the playing of Burr was like, you know, okay, this is not a Burr book report. You know, like the audience is not coming to the Richard Rogers Theater to to see how many facts I can recite about Aaron Burr. Um, so that that really, you, you know, I said what they want to see is a is a is blood pumping in the veins, a heart in the chest. They want to see, you know, young men and women in the prime of their lives, like living living this life. And so that set me free. And so I was really able to do the same thing with with William. I tried anyway. You know, you you. When you're playing somebody that's actually lived, you you need the facts first. You know what are all the facts of the life, you know, so that I can know those things. And, but then at the end of the day, you know what makes it. If any, if something's going to make it relatable, it is um, the thing that you know the things that change are the 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 fashions of the day, the laws of the time. You know those things change. What doesn't change is the the anger, the passion, the lust, the, the, the ambition, the bravery, you know, that is all stuff we can, that's the stuff that we can relate to. That's the stuff that's gonna make these people 
um, re you know, relatable, uh, that's going to that's gonna relate to us in our contemporary times, in our contemporary clothes. So, um, so anyway, I just, I try to get all the facts and then I try to let him alone and play a guy in a contemporary time. Because he, you know, he wasn't thinking that he was in some painting. You know, these people, they were not doing it to be in the history books. You know, they, they were living their lives on the front lines of a, of a revolution, you know, trying to help people and make change. I also thought, too, I, I, I wanted to make sure that, um, Casey and I talked about this, too, you know, that there was, there was, this was a great adventure, for William anyway, you know, for William anyway, you, you know, especially a guy who didn't, you know, didn't have to escape himself. There was some fun in it, too, for him. There was some danger. He was a young man, and this was, ex it's, it was exciting. You know, what a, what, can't think of a better way to use your life, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia, tell me about finding her, Harriet's singing voice, because yeah. we talked about her image, but we, I don't think we have any, any recordings of her, no. is that right? No recordings. Um, so I, I, I guess it was about trying to figure out where in my body it was supposed to come from, because I know what I am. I know that I am a coloratura soprano. I know that, uh, because I've been singing all my life as me. Uh, but that is not useful to her. Um, and so it was about trying to find what, what was authentic to her, what made the most, um, I guess, the most sense, the most pure sound, because the music that comes from her is not performative, it's about communication. It really is about, in its purest sense, trying to get one thing from her to someone else. It's about telling you that she's there now, or it's time to go, or wait, don't, don't come yet, or uh, I'm leaving, or goodbye. It literally is that. So it needed to feel grounded and immediate and pure. And so uh, we, Casey and I, just experimented with the sound and I, and I decided that it wanted to feel um, rounder than my sound. So we, I, in my head, because I see it like a, I see an image, so I, in my head I put it in my solar plexus and my, and my, like my diaphragm, so it felt like it was like heavier than where, where my voice lives. Because I felt like that, that's, a hard, that's a harder place to put um, frills on things. It's a harder place to make things performative. It's a harder place to, to make pretty. Um, and then so all you have is really the purest sound and the breathing of it. Um, that's, that's how I found her voice. And we just kept going with it to see how, how it would connect. And was the singing always part of the script or was it? Yeah. It was, even Definitely. before they you. They didn't were. put it in for me, I promise. They didn't put it in for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that is, it's part of her story. She used to sing to communicate. She used to sing to tell people where she was, when she was leaving, if she was leaving, if it was safe to go. And depending on which verse, you would know what um, to do. Each verse was coded with a special instruction. Um, so that's what would happen. Yeah. And th those songs are the songs that she would sing. This is why she made a good spy later on in yeah. life, because she was able yeah. to communicate, communicate in this kind of way. Yeah. Even then. Yeah. Um, and I read that even though you had to do all those stunts in the cors corsetry and whatever, all those you know torture devices of the era, that, that you actually found that sort of empowering rather yeah. than constricting. Yeah, um, I took <laughs> before I uh, got to set. I asked them to give me the corset that I would be wearing, so I could wear it off set, so I could be used to what that felt like. Um, it makes you move differently. Um, it makes you uh, uh, I don't know the weight of your body is in a different place. If you're if you're in a corset and you then put two heavy, full petticoats on, all the weight is, in, is on your waist and your hips. And so you're having to move in a different way in order to make things work. And so it just, it felt like I was strong doing it, because you have to be. Um, there's no way you can't be if you're having to climb up the side of something. You've got a corset and you've got a coat and you've got a jacket and you've got a skirt on, all of those things. Um, and I, I liked how it felt because it meant that there was one extra thing that I had to dig into in order to, to achieve the, the, the stunts that I was doing. It just, I felt like it was another thing that helped to tell the story, yeah. Leslie, did you ever want to try on one of the corsets? <laughs> I did had I, one for him. Did I have a what? 
Want to oh, try on one of the courses? I never wanted to try on one of the courses. <laughs> <laughs> no. Like, really, never, never in Hamilton, none of you guys ever went backstage and messed around with other people's outfits back and forth? <laughs> Listen, I know you were looking for some exclusive. <laughs> Somebody gets one Pulitzer Prize and they want an exclusive <laughs> on the New York Times. <laughs> uh, no, uh, no. Uh, I, I thought Cynthia was perfectly capable of wearing her corset. <laughs> I thought Philippa Sue and Renee Elise Goldsberry and Jasmine Cephas Jones looked amazing in those corsets. I was happy not to be among them. <laughs> <laughs> good. There is something quite fascinating about what happens after 18 hours in that corset, though. It's like you start seeing stars. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't know what to do with yourself. You're like, I can't move. It hurts everywhere, and I don't know what to do, but I'm still moving. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Now, you guys actually knew each other prior to this film, right? You're, you're friends in, in real bit. life. Like, you're, are, you, are you the godmother of his yes. child? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> She's a great godmother, too. How did we you... could give out a Oscars for godmothers. <laughs> She'd get one. I paid him to say that. <laughs> Thank you. How did you meet? How did you guys meet, or how did you, you hit it off? You this story, because I, I love, love hearing this it. Story. I love this story. So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was singing at um, a friend of mine's wedding, uh, uh, Patina Miller. You guys know Tony Award winning mm -hmm. actress Patina Miller. Um, Patina Miller's Mars was getting married, and uh, Patina was three years under me at Carnegie. So she was like my little sister at Carnegie. So anyway, so there's a wedding out in Queens. Uh, I was singing at the wedding, and there's a rehearsal. So I go to Queens, I do the rehearsal, and then I got to get back and, you know, get dressed and come back to Queens. So, um, but anyway, on my way out, I, I saw um, just this, this, you know, 12 or 13-year-old girl beautiful face little girl. She had on, you know, knee socks and like little shorts and big old Steve Urkel glasses. Just the cutest little face, you know? And I said, oh, Patina's little cousin is so cute. You know, I don't, I don't have time to introduce myself right now, but I, I'll, you know, she must be a flower girl or something. I'll introduce myself later. Um, so I come back, I do my thing in the wedding, it's a beautiful wedding, and then at some point we, uh, in the middle of the wedding, we all like are instructed to look this way and there's a goddess up on the balcony in this grand gown, and she's singing this beautiful song. It was Love Is, this Chrisette Michelle song, Love Is. And I was like, is that the same little child? Is that the girl? <laughs> it was So in one day, I saw like the full range of Cynthia Revo's, you know, <laughs> abilities. I saw the, the innocence of this little girl. I was certain she was 13. I mean, not a day over 13. <laughs> And then she's that, who is this woman? <laughs> and so at the reception, we met and, you know, I'm talking, I'm like, I told her the story, you know, I'm like, I was sure you were a child. And, um, and so yeah, she, you know, I want to move to New York. Do you have any advice about how I should move to New York? <laughs> <laughs> Love to move here. And so I gave her some advice. I told, I, told, uh, I told her what she should, like, there's a couple of shows you should see while you're in town. She didn't need my advice at all. And then, like, maybe... I was she... really just lying. Because <laughs> I couldn't say anything at that point. So I actually knew that I was coming you did. to New York to do the Color Purple. But I wasn't allowed to say anything. <laughs> so I was like, what's the best way to have this conversation? And, and I'd already, I knew Patina, and she knew what was going on, and I was, like... I was staying at her place for a little bit, and so she had invited me, obviously, to sing at this wedding, and I met Leslie, and I was like, I knew he was in uh, Hamilton at the time, but this was, were you at the public at that time? Or so? Yeah, or it was like, yeah, we were in between in or something yeah. like that, yeah. And, and I was like, I just want to know what it's like to, to move here. Like, what, what advice do you have for, like, being in New York and, like, coming to New York? Really just trying to garner some conversation. We stayed in touch. Yes, we and did. And then, uh, yeah, our shows premiered the same, mm -hmm. the same season, so we, yeah. were, we saw each other a lot. So what did it mean for you guys to work opposite each other in a story of this caliber? I love working with Leslie because I feel like uh, he um, understands me and my quirks and the things that I want to try, and he's sort of completely open to, to trying things with me, um, and I feel very safe with him for that. Uh, so it meant a lot to be in this with him. I accosted him for this. I, like, I forced him into doing this with me. <laughs> yeah. 
He didn't have a choice. <laughs> uh, we had done, we had done uh, another movie together. <laughs> God only knows when it'll see the light, light of day. But we'd done this other movie together. We had a, a, a great time working mm -hmm. together. I knew, um, I mean, just Cynthia is like, Everybody should be lucky enough to have a friend like Cynthia Rebo. She's just, you know, she's so loyal and <laughs> loyal and supportive and, you know, like just cares about you. She makes you feel like she cares about you more than anybody else. But she does that to the grips, too. And she does that to the craft service people, too. You know, that's what she does. But anyway, I was number one on the call sheet of this other movie and she had been she had done all that for me. And so when Cynthia sent me the script and and uh, Deborah, our producer, sent to the script. I was looking forward to the opportunity to doing the same thing for her, you know, to just support her in this, you know, um, Herculean task that, that was before her. Or we, we should change it. Heridian, Heridian <laughs> task before her. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I was looking forward to the chance to support her, but Cynthia will not be outdone. And so even on this set, she was thinking about me more than I was thinking about her. And it's what she does. It's what she does. You can't outgive her. It's, you can't do it. Well, we're, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to end on, on a, a question for both of you guys. Did working on this film change your perspective of what's possible in any given historical moment, like perhaps the historical moment that we're in now? Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll give you the last word. I don't want to say, let me say something and then you take okay. the last okay. word. Um, I think that, you know, the story of Harriet Tubman is going to be, you know, if you compare it to now, I mean, you know, in, in the same way, not quite the same way, but in, you know, in our own way, there are things that need to change about the country things that need to change about the nations, real systemic changes that need to happen, you know, for us as a nation, right? Um, you know, Harriet couldn't be tasked with ending slavery by herself, but she found a way to use her life. She found a way, you know, I, I think that the, the story of Harriet Tubman is gonna always be the one ab about the individual um, potential you know, to, to make change with, with one little life, you know, how, what, what great things you can do. So it doesn't take the onus off the country to end slavery. It doesn't take the onus off the country to make those changes that they need to make. Um, but we also have real agency and real uh, potential to, to make change and do great things with our one little life. I mean, only really to add to that, um, for me, I, I looked at it in this way. The fact is Harriet was five foot, five foot nothing, uh, and she was pretty much on her own. She was underestimated consistently. Uh, she had very little means, could not read, could not write, uh, but still managed to make it to freedom over 100 miles, uh, make it back again make it back again, make it back again, times 13, uh, save 70 people by herself. Then she was the first woman to lead a battalion <laughs> and, uh, and managed to bring another 750 plus to freedom. I say that to say this, um, if you feel like you are small and insignificant and you feel like you have been underestimated consistently, look uh, within yourself and find that small still voice that says that you have the power to do almost anything because it is possible. Uh, if someone who didn't have uh, what we have at our fingertips could do what she did, then we have no excuse. Leslie, you are right to give her the last word. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You've been a great audience. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Cynthia.